Welcome to Meet the Candidates here on WCMU. We are joined uh, by Dana Nessel, the Democratic candidate for Michigan Statewide Office of Attorney General. She is seeking election to a second four-year term to that office. Attorney General, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. You are, as we said, seeking uh, the re-election. Uh, if you were to sum up what you found in this campaign uh, and talking with prospective voters across the state, uh, the issues that are still prevalent that you have been dealing with and, and would continue to give your attention to, as well as newer concerns that you would want to address, uh, the top one, two, or three concerns that most of the voters have said to you. Well, I think there's so many of them out there. But, you know, I think that for consumers, they want to feel as though they're being protected. And that's such a large part of the work that we do at the Department of Attorney General. And what I've been really focused on during my last four years in office. So whether it's our work with the Elder Abuse Task Force, um, ensuring that we're protecting seniors around our state from uh, neglect, from abuse, from economic exploitation, whether it's the work we've done to secure over $800 million dollars uh, from suing drug companies um, to help relieve communities out there still suffering from the opioid epidemic. You know, we've worked really, really hard to do that. Uh, whether it's our work against robocalls, we've significantly decreased the number of robocalls, the vast majority of which are illegal, and trying to scam and con people out of their money. Um, we've significantly reduced that by having an entire unit that's just dedicated to that. So those are consumer protection types of issues. But beyond that, of course, we have many others. We have the ongoing threat to democracy in our state and in our nation. We've been very aggressive about going after domestic terrorist groups and ensuring that they can't hurt communities all around the state. We haven't had a mass shooting the way that we've had uh, in many other places on 4th of July parades or you know churches, synagogues, grocery stores, because we have been so active in this space in terms of protecting uh, communities against these sort of, you know, domestic terrorist groups, white supremacist groups. Um, but furthermore, the threat to democracy itself. And, you know, candidly, I'm running against someone who worked very hard to try to undermine the 2020 election and who still is trying to decertify the results of uh, the 2020 election, which we know was safe, secure, and accurate. But lastly, the thing that's very important to me is ensuring that women in this state, that all people in this state know that they have reproductive rights. Uh, and so, you know, I have worked arduously to ensure that doctors and nurses and women could not be um, thrown into jail or prison for making what is a private medical decision between themselves and, and their physicians and their families, uh, and not a decision that ought to be made by politicians in Lansing or politicians in Washington, D.C., and making sure that people have the ability, whether it's to obtain safe and legal birth control uh, or, you know, in events in which they need to, to be able to choose um, to terminate a pregnancy. I just I don't think it's the, the province of the government to be able to do that. And I think that women in this state should have the same right that they've had for the last 50 years in this state and in this nation. Is that effort then uh, geared to, and, and there have been many discussions about the specific language of Proposal 3 that uh, voters will be uh, weighing in on, on uh, November 8th, but your efforts then, and if you want to speak to that ballot proposal, to return the state fully now that, that the, dis the, uh, the control of this issue has been brought back to the states, to have us return to exactly the framework of the Roe decision from 1973 or a modification of that in any way as we look at uh, the various issues, the ever going and changing issues of women's health in particular? Yeah, I mean, look, I've spent a lot of time reviewing that ballot proposal. And what I would say is this, it does return us to what we had prior to Roe v. Wade being overturned with a few additional protections. So my, my opponent has indicated that he believes that birth control should be treated the same as illegal fentanyl shipments, right? And I don't want to live in a state where, um, you know, uh, consenting adults don't have the ability to legally 
uh, purchase or use birth control. This would codify that as a right into the Michigan Constitution. Why is that necessary? Well, people like my opponent and, and even those on the United States Supreme Court are talking about overturning what has been a fundamental right for us in this country since 1965 uh, in terms of the legality of birth control. So that would be a right that people would have, irrespective of what happens in the courts or the legislature. Um, it would also allow for the proper management of miscarriage treatment so that when there is a miscarriage, if a woman requires a certain medication or a certain procedure so that she doesn't suffer major health complications following a miscarriage, uh, there could be no uh, interference with her medical treatment for that. And then lastly, um, fertility treatment. You know, uh, first of all, surrogacy is still illegal in the state of Michigan. We're one of, I think, only a handful of states in the country uh, where you'd have to go to another state if you wanted to have somebody uh, be a surrogate because uh, a couple experiences infertility issues. Uh, in addition, IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, could be criminalized in Michigan if Proposal 3 does not pass. And so things like, you know, uh, IVF would become part of our state constitution. No one could tell you and, and your spouse whether or not you could have fertility treatment uh, or not. Um, that would be your choice. So those are the types of things that Proposal 3 would do. And that's why I uh, vigorously support that proposal. If but can I say one last thing about this? Certainly, yes. The, the role of the Michigan Attorney General is so incredibly important if you are a person who supports Proposal 3. Um, because if this passes, and, and from the polling that I've seen recently, I think it's more likely than not that it will pass. Uh, and I think it's largely supported by the electorate here in Michigan. It will be challenged. There's no question it'll be challenged. It was challenged before it got onto the ballot and almost didn't. And I, I had to draft an amicus in support uh, of getting this ballot proposal just to a place where the voters could actually cast a ballot for or against it. But it'll be challenged after it passes. And you are going to need to have somebody uh, in the role of Michigan Attorney General that vigorously defends the will of the voters, uh, which is something I strongly believe in. So if the voters decide that this should be passed, then I'm going to be there um, as a, you know, an ardent supporter in my capacity uh, in which I would be arguing on behalf of uh, this law, you know, becoming part of our state constitution as the voters um, would have it be. My opponent, I think, is very different, and I, I don't believe that he would vigorously uh, work to uphold the law and defend it in court. If we were to look to uh, the question, you, you brought up the topic of uh, the threats to democracy, and certainly there are the, the, the criminal elements to that concept that, that we're all aware of and the January 6th events and so forth, but also election integrity and uh, the, the security of the ballots being cast. And I know that this, uh, a lot of this responsibility uh, is in the hands of the Office of the Secretary of State, but what is the role? Is it defined enough? Does it allow this office or, or would you propose changing the the role of the attorney general's office to look at the questions of how we deal with what happens on election day and should there be um, issues that need to be corrected or or um, fraud that takes place well uh, let me explain what the roles and the duties are of the attorney general as it pertains to elections um, i'm very active in that space in terms of firstly making sure that people can vote uh, without fear of threat or intimidation. That's a big part of what I do, and I've been coordinating uh, with law enforcement at the local level, at the county level, and at the state level, and the federal level, all across the state of Michigan for the purposes of this election. I did that also in 2020 to make sure that people could vote securely and, and not be threatened during the course of that process. Um, we also make sure, of course, that um, there are not irregularities during the course uh, of the work of the counting boards. We don't want to have situations where there are people who are either there causing threats to those who are counting the ballots or causing disruptions during the counting process. Uh, and then, of course, after the election, we want to make sure of a number of things. One, 
that we're upholding the will of the voters. And that means, for instance, me having to go to court uh, uh, over and over and over again in 2020 and 2021 just to uphold the results of the election and the will of the voters. Uh, in one case, of course, uh, in the presidential race where Joe Biden, we know, uh, had beaten Donald Trump by over 154,000 votes. And yet you had challenge after challenge after challenge, including the challenge by Sidney Powell on the King case. Um, we had to defend that. The challenge by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, uh, where he took us to the United States Supreme Court in an effort to decertify the election in Michigan. We won that case. And then even this effort by my opponent to decertify our election. And I think it's important um, that people remember that, you know, we had over 250 audits in this state and the Antrim County case alone, remember that they recounted the paper ballots to ensure that that was accurate. And it was that the uh, Republicans on the Michigan Senate Oversight Committee found that there was no fraud in the election. Um, and there might have been those who took advantage uh, of any kind of minor errors that were later corrected uh, and used that to spread misinformation and disinformation, as my opponent has done. But there was not actually fraud in the election. And I will say this, whenever uh, we actually determine that there is an effort to commit voter fraud, we vigorously prosecute it. No, it doesn't happen very often, but it does from time to time, right? Um, you're always going to have some bad actors, but because we have so many multiple layers of review and we, because we have such a decentralized system where you have, you know, over a thousand clerks, most of whom are Republicans, but a, a mix of Democrats and Republicans all over the state that are in charge principally of their elections, you know, and because we have paper ballots in this state, so we can confirm whatever the results uh, of, you know, electric, electron equipment tabulators told us, um, we have the safest, most secure, and most accurate elections imaginable. It's an incredibly safe process. Uh, but there are people out there, like my opponent, that still you know, deny the results of the 2020 election. And will still say that those results weren't accurate. Well, how is this man supposed to defend the results of the will of the voter if he thinks it's his job to decide who the winner is in an election and not to uphold hold the, the will of the voters who actually voted in that election. You know, that's not my choice to make, right? It's not for me to say who should win or lose in an election, but it is up to me as the attorney general to defend the will of the voters. That's what I've done before, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. And that leads us to the opportunity for, in our last 30 seconds, to give you a chance to take all these concerns, the issues that you have had uh, serving in this office and that you look to do again in a second term should you be elected. That final message you would want to leave with the voters as they get set to go to the polls. Well, you know, as I've always said, you know, the role of the attorney general is to be the people's lawyer. It should be to represent everyone. And whether I'm combating the utilities each and every time they try to raise our rates, uh, whether it's I'm going after companies that pollute our air or poison our water, which I do all the time, uh, whether it's me, you know, taking on the, the drug companies and trying to lower the price of insulin or trying to make sure that, um, products that are harming people, that those companies are, are held accountable and that people are indemnified. I am the people's lawyer and I'm here to serve the people. I'm not here to serve one particular person who may be a resident of the state of Florida. I'm here to represent you. And that's what I've been doing the last four years. And that's what I'm going to continue to do in my next term in office. Well, we appreciate your time speaking to the issues and especially to the statewide voters uh, as we approach election day. We wish you the best of luck the rest of the way on the campaign. And thank you again very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We've been speaking with Dana Nessel, the Democratic candidate for Michigan Statewide Office of Attorney General, seeking a, a re-election to a second four-year term. I'm David Nicholas on behalf of all of us here, urging you to go out and cast your vote on Tuesday, November 8th. All qualifying candidates were invited to participate in this series. Following the redraw of Michigan House, Michigan Senate, and congressional districts, check with local officials to make sure you are properly registered. Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th.